Welcome back to Money Mondays. It's Marcus back again. Uh, Money Mondays are a regular short video on topics of interest and anything new arising. We're just having general discussions. In today's episode, we're going to talk about a hot topic of interest rates. Um, there's a lot we're hearing at the moment and we uh, thought we'd better get a few of our experts or one of our experts in to uh, see how it's going to affect people and what he, their thoughts of it on. So welcome. I'd like to welcome Matt. Matt to the show. How are you, Matt? I'm well, good, Marcus. Good to see you again. Yeah, you too, mate. Matt, uh, from our other shows, people would know he's our CEO of Complete Wealth and he's a financial advisor himself and an expert in these areas. So I've brought him in today just to see what his thoughts on interest rates are and um, see if he can help uh, simplify some of the language that we hear. So um, what uh, is happening with interest rates at the moment? Matt, we keep hearing that people are going up. What does that mean for people? And well, yeah, so why is it such a hot topic? Um, yeah, well, I mean, uh, interest rates obviously been really low for a long time, but I, I guess probably what what we are seeing starting to hear a bit more of is more the expectation of when rates will go up and by how much. Uh, I think the expectation has been for a while that they they've been obviously at historic lows, and so we we're going to see an increase. But what has changed a little bit in in say the last sort of little while is the expectation of when that would happen and how much they might go up. That's certainly certainly what we're hearing. So where are they? Um, like the common message seems to be that well, there's inflation's rising, especially in the US, and that the CPI, which is the Consumer Price Index, um, which I might get you to elaborate on as well. Um, it's not so bad here as what it is in the US at the moment. Is that true? Yeah, look, I, I think it's probably important that maybe we start with some definitions. You, you know I like to be pretty precise and clear yep, about yep, what you know exactly. what we're talking about. Sorry, so I, was, yep. I think probably the first thing is to, to separate and understand CPI versus inflation. So CPI is what we hear about all the time when we hear about inflation. And, and as you say, it's the consumer price index. Um, but it's really important to recognise that CPI isn't inflation. CPI is yep. a measure. Uh, and inflation uh, is is a is a is a sort of different beast. So, uh, I, I guess probably the, the way to think of inflation is is the relative um, supply of money. Okay, so in in its in the most simple sense, there's a certain amount of money in the system, and there's a certain yeah. amount of goods and services that are available to be to to buy. And if the amount of money increases faster than the rate of goods and services increase, then you're going to have more money chasing the same value of things. So the yep. prices of those things are going to go up. Now, there's some advantages in having that happen at a relatively small rate. You want the money supply in general to try and keep pace with the amount of goods and services so prices are reasonably stable. And that's kind of, you know, one of the RBA's sort of targets is that kind of using interest rates to try and target that price stability. But inflation technically is, to, is the amount of money you know, available to buy goods and services. So we'll talk a little bit, no doubt, further on about how, how money is created and that sort of thing. But CPI is a measure of a certain um, bunch of prices of goods and services. So there's a whole bunch of different measures of CPI, which is something a lot of people don't realise. But there's probably two main ones that we, that we, we should sort of concern ourselves with. One is the, let's call it the official sort of ABS, and the ABS yep. collates all this data on a whole bunch of um, goods and services, and they do that via capital index, uh, capital cities, and there's a whole different versions they use, but they use essentially a, let's call it a, a central main one. And then the Reserve Bank, um, let's say, just plays with that a little bit. They adjust that, um, those uh, stats at a particular point in time based on what they feel adjustment should be made given you know what's happening in the short term. So we end up with this sort of CPI number which is supposed to be a measure of general goods and services that people would be using. Let's call it the average person in, in the economy would be using. Um, and how is yep. the prices of those things change? Because in theory, if, if the prices are all going up, then there's probably a bit too much money in the system. And therefore, the amount of money needs to be, um, uh, needs to be sort of reduced. And that's really what interest rates are. Interest rates should be, con should be thought of as the price of money. Okay, so if there's too much money in the system, you want to raise the price because that will slow demand, demand for money we're talking about now, 
and that will bring things yeah. back into to whack and then the reverse is true. So, so it's really important to, to appreciate that when you hear CPI, you're not talking, you're not necessarily talking about inflation. It might be a indication that inflation is happening, but it's not necessarily, you do, you do need to kind of look into it a bit, yeah? Okay, so what about inflation to um, relating to petrol prices at the moment being a hot topic? Is that yeah. sort of, I know it's a bit out of what we were talking about, but it's... No, it's a good example, sort of that, right? You because hear that on the radio. Like yeah, no, it's a good example, right? Because prices can go up for a whole host of different reasons. And, and the RBA tries to, when they, let's call it massage the ABS numbers, they try to take in some of those things into account. So they might look at something like petrol prices and say, look, there's a short-term supply constraint. Okay, that's yeah, a one-off or it's not going to, yeah. yeah, you know, whatever it may be. It might be a refinery blew up or, yeah. you know, there's a major disruption somewhere in the global supply chains, whatever it may be. And they, and they might look at that and say, oh, well, that's not inflation. In fact, early on, maybe sort of six months ago, this was very much the Fed's response in, in the US was they were talking about inflation would be relatively transitory because they were looking at these supply constraints, i.e. things not getting through ports and, you know, yeah. around the world, you know, um, as, as readily as they would because of COVID predominantly and saying, OK, well, that, the prices are going up because there's demand for this stuff and there's just not as much petrol coming in as people are demanding. So that's not inflation, right? That's just a short-term yep. supply constraint. And that, in, in theory, once a supply constraint is either mitigated because the high prices mean more people come in and do the same thing and drop the prices yep. down that way, or the things that cause the supply constraints have disappeared. And therefore, that's not inflationary. The problem, though, with things like fuel in particular and, and energy, is it's really important to appreciate that energy is the thing that powers everything else. Yeah. Right. So there's nothing more important than energy prices when it comes to the health of an economy in the medium to long term. The lower your cost of energy is, the faster your economy can grow, because almost everything we do is powered by machines and machines use use that energy. So food being human energy, that's reasonably important as well. But but the energy that powers machines is critically important because the price of energy increases the the price of everything else and so it can yeah. be inflationary even if it's a relatively short-term spike in prices because it can raise the cost of everything else in in the production chain if that makes sense okay so how does everything affect the interest rates and give us some background as to what people mean when they say interest rates like there can be a lot of different measures you're referring to like uh, i've heard you say the the uh, the RBA rates, the, and there's also other things like the bank bill swap rate, mixed mortgage rates, fixed rates, variable rates. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of terminology for people to get their head around. So, yeah, you're right. There's a lot of different interest rates, right? So, yeah. I mean, let, let's, let's sort of break that down a little bit, I suppose. So, again, I think starting from the point of view of understanding that interest rate is the should be considered to be the price of money, and the price of money is set by the market that you're referring to. So let's start with, you know, what, what's called the RBA target cash rate, which is the rate you hear when they they meet every, well, most months of the year. Um, I think 10 times a year they first meet. First Tuesday, set. is it? First Tuesday, um, especially in Melbourne on, in uh, November. Um, so what, what they do at that meeting is they, they're setting what they call the target rate. And that target rate is the overnight rate that the RBA essentially charges banks for the money that they're lending to, to, to banks. So that's going to form part of the funding cost. So if we take something like CBA, for example, CBA is gonna, um, to, to be able to lend money out, and we'll talk a bit about how they do that in a minute, but to be able to lend money out, they're gonna to have to have a certain amount of money on deposit or a certain amount of money in the bank, if you like. And how much it costs them to get that money is gonna be a driver of the interest rates that they have to charge. So obviously they're going to try and buy the money as cheap as they can. And the RBA official target rate allows them, depending on what security they have on deposit with the RBA, they're able to then borrow money from the RBA at that rate. So that's going to be a one impact in terms of their funding costs. Another one yep. is what they call the, the, the bank bill swap rate. Um, it's a pretty important yep. measure because there's, think of that as an interbank. Um, so it's you know banks swapping between each other. And that's one of those yep. ones um, that, that's, that's important because the markets tend to use that as a baseline for pricing other securities. So, you know, if Commonwealth Bank and ANZ and NAB 
you know, you, you, we, we see them uh, issue these interest rate securities and you know, listed on the stock exchange and where they're essentially the banks borrowing different forms of money. And what they do in setting the rates on, on those, you know, the, the coupon rates, so the interest rate that they'll pay, yeah. is they generally link that to the bank bill swap rate plus a particular margin. So it might be plus 2% or plus 5% or 3%, yeah. depending on the, again, the relative price, right? And that relative price comes down to what the market essentially will assess that risk as. So, you know, if it's, if it's a you know, major Australian bank, they might be able to, you know, issue their debt at the bank bill swap rate plus, you know, 1% or 2.5% or whatever. But if it was, you know, a, a, a corporate that's, you know, we're only a medium-sized company with, um, you know, a, a pretty high debt load already, they might have to, if they want to issue debt, they might have to do it at bank bill plus five or six or 7%, for example. So the bank bill yeah. swap rate doesn't really affect too much in terms of, um, um, you know, the, the average sort of person, but it is one of those rates that if, you, if, you, uh, if you're looking at what the cost of funding is likely to be for banks, it's, it's a good, uh, good indicator of, you know, um, how those funding costs are likely to change over time. Um, so they're probably the, the LIBOR is another one people might hear about, which is the London, London yep. Interbank one. Um, there was a there was a famous um, case um, brought against a few banks a few years ago that were sort of they were basically structuring that for their own interest. It, it's 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 sort of like the international kind of version. It's a very important rate because it helps set the relative risk pricing of different sort of you know fixed interest or bond assets. So they're probably the main ones people. Um, you know, if, you, if we're, we're following these, the main ones we're, we're sort of looking at for changes because we're, what we're looking at is what we call the risk-free rate of return and then the relative margin on that risk-free rate of return. So the, the RBA or sort of overnight government money is essentially you know, sort of risk-free, if you like, because uh, it's cheap yeah. and it's sort of backed by the RBA. And then, the, you know, the, the corporate debt or the other debt that, that, that might be issued by semi-governments or governments will be that you know, bank bill plus a plus a margin gives you an indication of the relative, you know, risk of that the credit worthiness risk of that particular borrower. Very good. So, say from a simple homeowner's point of view, when rates are likely to go up, should they be looking to fix their rates now? We hear about that quite a bit. So, yeah. So, little... so like my favourite answer. Is it depends, right? Um, so, so I guess it's it's important. Probably it's important to sort of backtrack a little bit and just um, and talk a bit about the a thing called the yield curve, right? So, um, keep in mind that interest rates themselves vary depending on time frame. So, uh, the overnight rate, the, one, the reason that RBA cash rate is so low and one of the pretty much the lowest rates going around all the time, is because it's an overnight rate. You know, whereas a one year or two year or three year out to 10 or 20, 30 year sort of government bonds, yeah, yeah. interest rates vary. Um, so the yield curve, a sort of normal yield curve sort of, you know, sort of goes up and flattens out as in the short term, interest rates, you know, relatively rise relatively quickly. And then once you get out to sort of three, four, five plus years, the rate increase doesn't tend to increase so much in what we call a normal yield curve. And what that yeah. means is, is there's... Um, there's a, a discount, if you like, um, for short-term versus long-term money. And, and what the yield curve represents, if you look at it, the yield curve in the actual fixed interest markets, is a normal yield curve rep, you know, would, would say, look, in the short term, um, you know, interest rates will be lower. In the long term, there's not much difference between you know, the medium to, to, to very long term, assuming rates aren't going to change very much. Whereas if there's an expectation that rates will rise much more in the future, then you might start to get what we call a steepening of the yield curve. So the long-term rates start to go higher much faster. Or you yeah. can get a situation where, obviously, we had um, a few years back where you get more of an inverted curve. So the long-term rates are actually lower than the shorter-term rates. And that's because there's an expectation that rates in the future will be lower than they are today. And as a result, the yield curve sort of fix that. So it's important when you look at mortgages is to understand where the banks get their funding from specifically for mortgages. So yeah. when it comes to variable rate um, mortgages, the banks generally source them from basically everywhere, from you know, customer deposits, yeah. from the money they can raise um, through you know, those fixed interest instruments we were talking about before, and even different facilities that they might have you know, with the RBA, for example. So, so variable interest rates 
are sort of managed, if you like, by the banks in that sense. Whereas with fixed interest rates, because they are essentially a fixed contract for three years or five years or two years or whatever, they tend to buy those directly from the market. And so when, you, when you're fixing your home loan, really what you're doing is through the bank, you're buying debt from the fixed interest market. So you're buying at whatever those prevailing rates are. And if the prevailing, the yield curve says that rates in the future are going to be higher, then those rates are going to be higher. But keep in mind, that's an expectation. So um, what you'll tend to find is if there's an, if the general feeling is interest rates will be higher in the future, that will be reflected in those prices yeah. for fixed rates, okay? So, and then look, there's, you know, in, in, in a really sort of simple sense, doing up a quick, well, I'll just take through a quick example we've done here just to sort of show the effect of that because the time of this kind of really matters. So I just jumped on the CBA website because I knew we were going to talk about this and had a look at what their, their sort of discount variable rate is compared to their fixed rates at the moment. So at the yeah. moment, they're, they're sort of showing sort of 2.2 as a discount uh, principal interest owner-occupied you know, sort of yeah. cheap loan, whereas their fixed rates for three years are sort of running out to uh, 3.94 for the equivalent. I was going to ask product. you about that because uh, you have heard that they've up, they have been increasing them slightly, like in the last few months. So yeah, and that's a reflection of the money market. The, yeah. Well, it's not the bank doing that, right? So so it's not yeah. CBA saying here's what we think is going on. They are literally just going to the market and saying. You know, to people who are essentially lending the money, so investors in fixed cost? interest markets, yeah. which will be super funds and institutional yeah. investors, or whatever, and they're saying, "This is how much we want for three years. We want, you know, whatever the the, the rate is." And and obviously the bank's in chucking its margin on top of that. So the price yeah. the bank's paying for that money Impressive. is really set by the market, right? The bank doesn't care. They don't care whether rates are one percent or twenty one percent. They're just taking what the market's making available, you know, putting their margin on it and saying, well, here you go. If you want to fix your rate for three years, here's the price. So even us. though on the tally they say the banks are raising their rates, it's not actually them. Well, so, the banks are raising their rates yeah. and they're the ones selling it to you. But, yeah, it, the effect is it's, it's you know, the fixed interest they, market. Because they've got, got no the control up. over it. Yeah. Correct. That's right. They can massage a little bit in terms of, we'll talk a bit about how they fund you know, the variable side. But fixed rates, it's relatively straightforward in the sense that they buy that money mm. from the market, which is why when you enter into a fixed rate contract with a bank, there's generally a break clause in those loans. And, that, and what that means is, is if the bank, um, the bank's now expecting to receive, you know, let's say in this example, 3.94% for the next three years. If you want mm. to pay back faster or you want to break that loan, the bank can't go back and hand the money back to the investor they borrowed from in the market. They've got to keep yep. paying whatever their coupon is. So if interest rates have gone up and you've mm. hand the money, you've borrowed half a million dollars from the bank and you hand that money back to the bank, they can go and invest that on the market. Now, if they can generate more than what they were paying out because rates have gone up, yep. they'll make a small profit and they'll actually give that to you, right? That, that you'll get that sort of small gap difference on that extra money they make. So when rates go up and you break your fixed interest loan, you can actually get paid out a bit to, um, to break that early because the bank can make it, yeah. more money, right? But the revert, and that, that really happens, obviously. Most people don't volunteer to, to do that when rates have gone up, when they've got a cheaper rate. Mm -hmm. But, um, but the, what tends to happen is more the reverse of that. So when rates drop and people want to pay back their higher rate fixed interest loans, then obviously the bank, when they receive that to half a million dollars back and they tr try and invest that on the market for the balance of the term, obviously rates have gone down, so they're not going to be able to generate the same return and they'll, they'll, be, they'll then hit you up for the difference. So there's all that. Just the, it seems like a penalty, but it's really just an in interest rate differential. So it's important to realise that when you enter into a fixed rate loan, that the differential between rates now and in the future can have an impact on what um, you know, some potential break costs might be, yeah, particularly yeah. if rates go down. So, um, because the bank is literally buying that money off the market. So, um, so yeah, so, but if we look at this example, so, you know, if we're getting sort of more like 2.2 .2 today versus sort of, you know, yeah. more, almost four, if you like, for, um, for a fixed rate, what you've got to look at is, is say, okay, well, obviously I'm going to be paying more in the short term if I fix my loan. What's my average yeah. going to be over that term? And three years is... Not that long a time. So what sort of rate of increase? So we just ran a quick example here and said, okay, well, what, what, if, what if interest rates over that period of time, what if, they, um, uh, what if they sort of go up, you know, sort of 
25 basis points or 0.25% every couple of months. What would, what would that do and what would that change? So obviously we get a... Do you think they'll do that though? Uh, at that sort of rate? Uh, mm. I mean, I'll, I'll go fish. I think that's the... That, that, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a million I mean. dollar like question. Um, it really is because... And that's what makes it so hard. They, I, I don't, if it was that easy, everybody would know what to do. But um, a lot of people... It's like gambling, isn't it? You're taking a guess on... <laughs> which one's look it is be better because in, in america the other year they went up i remember they had three raises in a year yep and then they went back yes so, you know, you know well so but inflation wasn't a couple of things to keep in mind i think first of all that that um you got to understand that the the bond markets dwarf the equity markets by a, a yeah. huge factor right so so um a, apart from maybe currency markets bond markets are the biggest casino in the world okay yeah. so so anyone, anyone who is, calls themselves a genuine trader, they trade bonds, not equities. So yeah. because very, very small differences amplified, um, you know, in the billions and trillions, is, is, it's easy to make a lot of money with money, relatively yeah. small wins, right? So, but With low risk too, really, because there's but not it's, much. Well, when you say low risk, it depends on, that, that comes down to sort of trading strategy, but normally you're trading someone else's money. So it's, it, it, yeah. it's probably not, it, it's probably a bit of a stretch to call it sort of gambling, but you are trading you know, in a very, yeah. very highly leveraged sort of environment. It's literally like going and playing in the NBA, right? So you're, you're yeah. playing against the best, the very best of the very best sort of thing. So, so it's really important to appreciate that, uh, you know, in those markets, um, very small changes can make a big difference, right? Yeah. Um, so, so guessing where the yield curve's going to change and how let alone the credit worthiness of the underlying, you know, um, borrowers, but, but even just that yield curve can have huge ramifications. So, so yes, we, we have an expectation in where we think interest rates might go and get to. So what we look at is we look at how far do, you, do we think they'll go? Because that's more important. Uh, yeah. well, that's very important. And then we look at how relatively fast that might be. So, but do we know? We, 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 uh, we have a degree of precision that, that is... That is um, so variable that, that, it, that it, it doesn't warrant guessing. Um, yeah, so, so, but what, what's important, I guess, from, a, from an investment perspective is not so much, you know, because we're not trading, because we're not looking to take advantage of a particular opportunity, okay, we're more looking at what is going to be the impact on our wealth, okay? Yeah. So when we get to the end of a cycle like this, and that's really what we're talking about, we're talking about a change in, si in the cycle. Bottom out, yeah. So what's, what's, what could bring us undone? in the short term, okay? And what's the long-term impact on our wealth of being positioned in a particular way? Because if we're positioned in the wrong way and something reasonably predictable, so, so again, foreseeable, we can guess this might happen. Predictable, yep. we can guess it might happen and with a reasonable time constraint, okay? And then there's actionable, which is we can predict when it's gonna happen, how it's gonna happen, and precisely what to do about it. Now. Almost nothing is actionable, okay, which is why traders take lots of bets, right? Which is, yeah. as you know, not what we do. Some things are somewhat predictable, and I would say interest rates rising is probably now starting to fit into that category. Up until relatively recency, it was foreseeable, but it's now probably getting to the point where I'd say it's predictable that rates will be higher in the next six to 12 to 18 months. The question is, is how much higher? At what rate will they go up, and what impact will that have on the things that we own? So, in a perfect world, with interest rates, you know, I've often heard them talk about the target rate is around the was it two point seven five three. Well, it's changed. Yeah, it's changed. And again, so that gets it back to what we're talking about before, and sort of saying, well, what rate of price of money means money will be created at the right rate to match yeah. the way the economy is growing. So again, in a really simple example, if there's, there's a million dollars worth of stuff that the economy is producing and a million dollars worth of cash in the economy and, and that stays the same, then prices would always be stable. Yeah. The problem is, is you know, human beings, you know, some of them aren't lazy and they go out and find better ways to do stuff and so they create greater value. So what was a million dollars worth of economic output is now 1.2. Okay, and so if the supply of money doesn't keep up with that, 
right? Then yeah. you start to get an imbalance. And it's not so much the balance itself, it's the predictability of that. Because if, if you think about the, the, the impact on behavior, if prices are going to be much higher in the future, then the incentive is to spend now, okay? Yeah, if prices buy, are buy, going yeah. to be much lower in the future, the incentive is to hold back and wait. Okay, and so getting the balance of that so that you get the right velocity of money, the right activity in your economy, that's in a really simple sense kind of the, that's the dance that the RBA and other policymakers are trying to do. Now, there's no thing, there's no way of measuring the economy with any degree of accuracy, especially yeah. in real time. So again, and there's no way of measuring the amount of money. So keep in mind that money, there's really two ways money's created. It's printed like either physically by the mint, yeah. right, uh, on the Reserve Bank, um, or electronically by the Reserve Bank, or it's actually printed by, by banks themselves. So, you know, CBA or NAB, because keeping in mind, we have this what's called a fractional banking system. So every, t every amount of capital or deposit that, that CBA has, they're essentially allowed to lend out a certain amount of money. So if that increases, they can lend out, if for every dollar that comes in, they can lend out a multiple of that. Yeah, they okay. had that, that. That come about in the GFC, didn't it, with the banks? They had to have so much. Also, you know, so the amount of capital, in. amount of capital they've had, that's changed a bit with different sort of, yeah. you know, basal sort of reforms and all these other bits of the, the tier one capitals and all those sorts of things. We, we won't go into that detail today, but so yes, yeah, so, so the requirement of the amount of capital a bank has has changed, and the reason for that is because the bank always lends out more money than it has. That's what the yeah. fractional banking system is. They've only got a fraction of the money they've actually lent out. And that's why the, the, the real way a bank goes broke is you get a, a run on the bank, right? And that is depositors come in and say, well, hang on, there's not enough cash if I want all my money, so I'll better hurry up and get it. And every time they take some out, the, because of the fractional system, the ratio gets worse and worse and worse and suddenly get to the point where now everyone wants to run in because of the bank. So a run on the bank is what sends the bank broke. And that happens because the depositors are worried they won't get their money back. Now, that was an issue with the GFC and, and the Fed and RBA and central banks around the world sort of stepped in to, to sort of cover that liquidity. That was the actual, the, the actual banking crisis of the GFC. But that can happen with an individual bank if for whatever reason they don't have that capital, capital adequacy. Yeah. But that, that's APRA's role in making sure that they do and they comply in that sort of way. Which is a really important point because coming out of the GFC, the RBA actually established a couple of different facilities, if you like, or a couple of different programs, mm -hmm. whereby the, the assets they would allow a bank to put on their balance sheet. So they, the, the bank would say, hey, here's our security to the Reserve Bank. We'll give you all this security. We want to borrow money from you. The nature of the security they would accept, let's just say they relaxed it somewhat and they would take a lot of things that they wouldn't have taken before. Okay. And so banks were allowed to borrow money from the RBA, more money at lower rates than they normally would be allowed to. And that's been unwinding. Yep. This is another reason why their funding costs have increased, is because yep. they used to borrow from mum and dad, you know, an almost unlimited amount of money at point one. And mum yep. and dad have said, we're not letting you have that anymore. Now you have to borrow at a point five. Yep. Or you can only borrow so much because all that other stuff we, we used to, you know, your homework was security and your, your favorite dog and all those was, we won't take this anymore. We only, but we only want hard assets like your, you know, your push bike and, you know, and so yeah. the amount you can borrow is less. So because of that, banks have had to go to other funding sources, particularly credit markets, where obviously the cost is higher. And so their funding costs are increasing as a result of that as well. So that's important to understand is that the bank's funding costs themselves are going up for no other reason other than because that's being, those structures are being unwound as well. And that's going to affect rates. Yep. So, um, we suppose we've already we've spoken a bit about fixing loans, but uh, you got any more? You want to... Yeah. So let me get you back to the, to that example, right? So the timing's important, right? So I was giving the example before. If we if we at two point two, and we can switch today, but we'll straight away start paying basically four. We're going to be paying more interest in the short term. So Initially. what matters is the rate at which that goes up. So if you look at this this graph here, you can see that. Um, you know, in this, this here, we've got, uh, I'm just assuming every two months, rates go up by 25 basis points or 0.25. Yep. That, that's pretty aggressive, particularly in the short term. And that happens throughout the whole sort of three-year period here, right? Whereas our fixed rate, which is you know, just below four, that sort of stays flat. 
So as you can see, for the first few years, you know, rates, our rates would still be lower on the variable, but yeah. eventually we get to the point where that would be higher. So, but what does that mean for interest? So if we look at that from a, purely from an interest rate point of view and the interest we physically pay, because that's what matters, okay? Now, what I haven't done in this example is I haven't amortized the loan, it gets a little bit complicated then just, but yeah. so, so this graph is, is a bit pessimistic. It would be better than this in terms of the comparison. But this sort of blue line here shows the additional interest that you'd be paying by paying that higher rate. So you can see, again, obviously, until rates equalize in sort of, you know, a couple of years time, you're going to be paying more interest out. And then after that point in time, you'd be paying out um, the, the interest differential starts to go the other way. So this yellow line shows the net amount of interest, extra interest yeah. that you've paid. And so in this example, you can see it's not until you get almost out to the end of that three year period where you're actually going to be ahead. Yeah. Okay. And so what that means is if rates don't raise as fast as, as predicted here with that sort of 25 bips yeah. every couple of months, then you're almost certainly going to be better off not fixing your loan at these current rates because the differential's too great for a three year period, okay? Yeah. So that's the sort of calculation you kind of need to do. So you need to look at saying, well, and, and this doesn't include repayment. So if we're gonna repay faster, that's gonna blow it out even further. If rates raise faster, it's gonna go the other way. So, but the way the sensitivity looks now, you can see that for three years, you can see rates are probably not really worth it no. if, if you're, you're doing sort of minimal repayments, the gaps, gaps are a little bit too big. Um, now, obviously if rates raise um, uh, in the interim faster, that can come from either official rate increases from the RBA, mm -hmm. but keep in mind that the banks now, you know, once upon a time they used to get the majority of their funding from the RBA, like a few decades ago, yeah. now it's well under 50%. So they're less, that, and that's why, you know, in recent years, people would have seen once upon a time when the RBA cut by 25 basis points or raised by 25 basis points, the banks did the same. And then they yeah, broke they that. Yeah. They broke that and they started to do it differently. And the reason they do it differently is because more of their funding comes from other sources. So their funding costs, sometimes they do sort of out of cycle um, mm -hmm. uh, increases or drops. And that's just because those, the money market, you know, the fixed interest markets themselves, you know, they've moved, the expectations moved more so and the banks therefore have to change their funding arrangement. So this is a pretty simplistic kind of look at it, but, but I guess the, you know, the assessment you've got to make is how quickly do I think rates are gonna go up over the next three years? Because with the gap at the moment, they're gonna to have to go up reasonably quickly and reasonably substantially for you to be better off on a pure yeah. outcome point of view. Keep in mind that the timing of that cash flow is also you're paying less at the beginning and more later, which is always better. What that doesn't consider though is the relative risk, right? So if you're, you know, if, if 4% is the, the limit of your capability, right? What you don't want to be doing is getting stuck with rates at five or six. Mm. Now, as it stands at the moment, I think that's extremely unlikely in the next couple of years, but it's certainly not, it's not impossible. And, and it's probably going to be another 12 or 18 months before how high rates go is going to be clear. We, we would err on the side of we think rates are probably going to end up a bit higher than market expectations, and they're probably going to get there a bit faster. You know, the, 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 the current um, expectation in terms of rate rises is what we've been expecting for a while, and it's taken a while yeah. for the rest of the market to sort of catch up to that. Um, because you know, from our perspective, going back to what we were talking before about inflation and those su supply constraints, it seemed much more obvious to us that that wasn't going to be you know, just a short blip and transition because there was too many things um, contributing to you know, uh, increase in prices. So, um, but that's the guess, right? So as it stands at the moment, the gap looks a little bit big, but it's a case by case basis. It depends on the amount of money borrowed, depends on your ability to service and those sorts of things. So definitely worth having a look at. And it might be a case for some people where it's maybe 50-50 or 25-75 or something like that just to help mitigate some of those risks. And probably the last thing to say on that is keep in mind that, that if, you're, if the loan is for investment purposes or for income reducing purposes yeah. and therefore the interest is deductible, then to the degree that your net tax offset to that will be sort of a third to a half, you're not getting that full rate increase, if that makes sense. So that's gonna be a factor yeah. in the, the break even of this as well. 
Oh, very good. So looking at it from an investment point of view, what because um, yeah, the, how does the increasing rates affect the investment environment with the share markets and so on? Well, there's a couple of really important things to consider there. Probably the most important one is um, is increasing rates means a change in the discount rate. So a discount rate being the rate that you apply to future earnings to decide uh, how valuable something is. And the higher the discount rate, the lower the value, essentially. That's, that's probably the thing people need to understand. So when rates are really, really low, companies' um, PE ratios or valuations tend to blow out because yep. um, the risk-free rate of return is very low and, um, and therefore the, the, the multiples that make sense mathematically in terms of valuation can be much higher. So that's one of the reasons why we've seen with these interest rates very low all around the world, we've seen some very, very high valuations, particularly of, well, even ignoring the real frothy end of the market, you're seeing some very high quality companies, but at very, very high valuations. Now, the problem with that is you can take a, you know, a company that's trading on a PE of, say, 40 times earnings. Even with a relative... So just for the people out there, the, the, the average PE for, you know, a standard, like, right value company is about 15? Or historically well, 15? Well, again, the answer is depends. So if you look at the market, the, let's just take the Australian market, as a, the long-term yeah. average is somewhere 15 to 17 in terms... Yeah. But, but in looking at the Australian market, there's a lot of relatively low-growth companies in that. Whereas if you were to take a market like the NASDAQ, um, in the mm -hmm. US, which is technology companies predominantly, you're talking about companies yeah. with much lower cost of capital or much, much lower um, capital and therefore their return on capital can be much higher. So, so it depends on the nature of the company. So, but, but, but 30, 40 times earnings is, is an extreme valuation regardless. But there are plenty yeah. of companies around the world that are and have been valued in that sort of range in recent times. So, as I said, it's not, not something, not an area of the market that, that our managers tend to participate in. And the main reason for that is because you get this situation where they're sort of priced for perfection. So, yes, the yeah. earnings growth potential might be there, but if they miss that, you know, the, the risk is quite asymmetric. So, you know, look, just looking at a quick example of saying if you had a company that was trading on 40 times earnings, and you get a change in interest rates, and so you, you only need a relatively small change in discount rate, and that valuation now might drop to 30 times earnings. So you've got no change in the prospect of the company, no change in its earnings growth expectation, but because the way you value the company has changed slightly, you actually mm. get a, quite a big difference, right? So that's sort of, you know, a, 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 a you know, 25% drop in valuation, just because, nothing to do with the company, just because no. the way you value the company has changed. Now, not only that, your interest rates have gone up, right? Which means costs across. Now, that's combined with the reason interest rates are going up is because inflation is increasing, which means costs are increasing. Now you've got a double whammy. You, you got a, your companies might, their costs might be increasing, you know, and, and there's, no, there's no corresponding increase in revenue. So now the profitability drops. So you get a sort of 20% drop in profitability plus a valuation differential. And suddenly now you can be 40 or 50% down on valuation even though the company hasn't changed. You know, yeah. it's still selling everything well, it's got great, it's got great you know, um, protection, economic moat, however you want to describe it, it's really high value, it's a, you know, it's, they're great at what they do, they're industry leaders, there's no real competition. All those factors might still be in play, but because the valuation metrics have changed, only slightly, but plays out for those very high PE companies in particular, now you're looking at a sort of 40% drop in valuation. And the problem with that is, that's about a 67% increase to get back to that point, right? Because returns are asymmetric on the downside. So, so suddenly, because you paid too much for this company, as great a company as it was, as good a track record it has, and, and it's hitting all of its yeah. marks, you're still down 40% in that stock. And that's the real danger of being behind the curve, if you like, from a valuation uh, point of view. So, um, so that's probably the most important thing, and again, you know, that's something yeah. we've obviously been very wary of for quite some time and, and a reason why we, we, we've been sort of underrepresented in particular in that part of the market. But um, the, other, the other ones to be, to be aware of is, is those areas of the market that are very sensitive to interest rates. So, you know, companies or sectors that borrow a lot, you know, have very high debt loads, um, you know, um, or have a lot of costs linked to inflation. Um, and then the, the, the opposite of those is there are, you know, things like property and infrastructure will often have their revenue tied to inflation. So 
to the degree that their costs aren't uh, increasing in the same way, that can sometimes be a potential win for those sectors. So there is a little bit of you know, interest rate sensitivity um, for those, so from an from a investment perspective. From an so, investor perspective, sorry, you go. Yep. Yeah, you go, you go. No, so from an investor perspective, I guess, you know, probably the, 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 the people you'll hear the most about will be pensioners and retirees. You know, they're, yeah. they're always, you know, particularly pensioners, obviously deeming rates will change. So as, as interest rates go up, deeming rates are likely to increase to reflect that. And, you know, what they'll learn on term deposits and cash and stuff will increase. And so it's interesting, you know, if you, if you d delve into that a bit deeper, you, the, 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 the wording around that will normally be that's a good thing for pensioners, right? So they're, they're going to earn more on their cash and earn more on their term deposits. But if you look into the mathematics of that, I, I, I'm afraid I don't really agree. First of all, you know, as you know, in, in the way we run our investment portfolio is cash never generates a return. And so we, we, we never like to have you know, excessive amounts of cash in turn to clients anyway, because cash isn't there to make money. Um, but those deeming rates go up, keeping in mind that the deeming rates got nothing to do with what you actually earned. Right? No, it's so just it, a set amount so they don't have to value every asset. So it's easy, right? Uh, so uh, so yeah. if you think of your deeming rates sort of, you know, 1%, but you can earn a yield out of your portfolio of say five or six, okay. Um, you're better off with. Yeah. Then, then you're much better off. But, but if, if, if the reason you're earning that five or six is because you've got a nice basket of good companies where their costs have increased, right? So they're, now their dividends might have to you know, drop or, or at least not Come grow down, as fast. Yeah. So your actual yield's dropping at the same time that your deemed rate is increasing. So the amount you're you're perceived to be receiving is increasing when the amount you're receiving is actually decreasing. So you're going to get a bigger hit to your pension, right? Yep. Now it's 50 cents a dollar, as you know, but, but again, it's not necessarily a windfall. So again, there's another reason why, you know, the answer is the best answers or the right answer is often a lot more counterintuitive than people realize. So right, rising interest rates is generally not a great thing for pensioners. Um, so it, it's really important to make sure you're structured properly, you know, when rates go up. So I, bit of a history lesson here for me and for others like I've worked at Centrelink for a long time I was and as an advisor and an assistant a lot of the things they come and say is oh you know um, we bought our house in the 80s and there was 18% interest rates you know and now we're retired and there's you know we're getting zero percent on it on our cash and term deposits but it's not that simple like it it seems that way because of the numbers there's a, the thing that's always got me is there's always been the gap between yep. the official interest rates, what you borrow money for and what you get paid. So can you get, just elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, look, it's been distorted a bit in the last sort of decade, um, particularly coming out of the yeah. GFC. Um, but, but you're right. So it's really important to look at. So again, interest rates, think of interest rates, the price of money. OK. Yeah. Uh, and, and inflation, right, being the, the rate at which the things you buy with the money is increasing. Okay, yep. so if, if the return on the cash is less than the rate of increase in the supply or the prices, then you're going backwards. So if inflation's yep. higher than cash rates, then you are literally losing money holding cash. And that we've yep. been in that situation now for a few years, right? Cash rates have been below that, right? Inflation's yep. been very low, but but been higher than than cash rates, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So so holding cash, you never historically the best you've ever really done out of cash above inflation is two or three percent. So whether rates yeah. were eighteen or or zero or yeah. three, right? The best the, the best return you ever get out of cash is normally only a couple of percent greater than inflation for any length of time because the two things are so closely linked together. So, and I know this. So back in the late eighties, I I I, um, I actually won a, a a bursary. The high school I was in, I won a bursary as a um, um, you know, for, for getting enough A's or whatever. And, yeah. and so I had a term deposit at the time and I, I got 15% for my, I remember getting 15% for my term deposit. Now, if I had any idea back then, what I, even half of what I know now, I would have got a 30 year, 40 year or however many decade long term yeah, deposit. Yeah, yeah, you would have invested it for the long term. Yeah. Um, because anything above nine or 10 would have been fantastic. But keep in mind that inflation well, was also the same time where my parents had to sell our house because they couldn't afford the mortgage repayments. So, yeah. um, you know, it wasn't all sort of beer and Skittles. So while I was, you know, living, you know, getting a great return on my, you know, couple of thousand dollars I had in this sort of turn deposits, you know, in the meantime, my, you know, my family had to move in with my, uh, 
with my uh, grandparents because we couldn't afford our mortgage repayments on our little house in, in Queensland. So um, that was a very, that was the result of very, very high inflation in the 80s and then leading into the recession we had to have in the 90s. And that's really the last time that interest rates, apart from a couple of lips just before the GFC and just after, yeah. that interest rates have actually risen. So you're right when you're saying earlier that it's not the experience of people, rising interest rates is not something that people, um, even even our age have had a, a material experience with. You have to go back on oh, a lot of young people history. are going to find it. But I suppose then there's the other thing that we haven't spoke about, which is connected to all of this, is wages growth. So, yes, you know, if these things are getting dearer and dearer, then wages have to keep up with those sort of things, hopefully. But usually they're, they're lagging behind, aren't they? Well, it's interesting. I was having so, that debate with someone just the other day, actually. He was telling no, me how they go. were... The, the, news, the, the news had convinced them that wages haven't kept pace with inflation. And, and, and I, you know, I guess my point on that is, you know, it reminds me of that old saying, if you torture a statistic long enough, you can get it to say anything. So I'm, I'm, I'm very sure I can find a statistic that proves that. But the, but the reality is there's two things, I guess, to, to think about here fundamentally. First of all, if wages don't keep price with inflation, wages is where the vast majority of money spent in the economy comes from. So if wages don't keep price with inflation, it, uh, it means we're not getting enough money to keep bidding prices up. All that means is someone else is. And the only someone else there is, isn't re really someone else, it's the other version of us, and that's government, right? So, so it, it's a really important thing to, to appreciate that there's no such thing as government money, right? There's only the money yeah, that they've money, taken yeah. from us and that they're spending on our behalf. But the thing to appreciate with government money, and this is, even more so in the US to appreciate, is that is this, this concept of quantitative easing, which has been so popular in recent times, is the government essentially yeah. spending money, right? And then yeah. because they can't really borrow that, they get the Federal Reserve to print the money to buy it off them, so to buy that back out of the market sort of thing. So, so, but they're spending that money first up before it's washing itself into the system, okay? So it's no yeah. different to if Again, we'll go back to the example I gave earlier. There's a million dollars worth of products and services in the economy, and there's a million dollars in the economy. Then I come along and print a million dollars. Okay, I can literally go and buy everything. Yeah. All right, before anyone realizes that everything's now worth two dollars, not one, because there's twice as many dollars in the economy. But because oh, yeah. I get to do that before it's worked its way into the system, I'm going yeah. to be able to buy the vast majority of things at, 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 at the old price, not the new price. Does that make sense? And so that, the impact of that's really important. That's, it's quite complicated in terms of the way it plays out. But the other really important thing to, to, to appreciate is that um, there's so much variability in these statistics that you really have to delve into what they're talking about. If you think about if wages don't keep price with inflation in the long term, then inflation will have to drop just purely mathematically. So, so yeah. that's not a sustained thing. Um, certainly some areas, that's a different thing. And I'll talk a little bit about the impact of inflation as a really good graph I want to show you in, in respect to that. But keep in yeah. mind that also is there's a lot of changes in the way people behave now. There's a lot of people yeah. who are changing the number of hours they work, where they work. We're seeing people leave the city and go and work four days a week and work remotely. Um, yeah. And so you're seeing people whose wages used to be, you know, $300,000 working 70 hours a week. They now work 30 hours a week and they only earn 150. That feeds into those into that data. So that looks like they've taken a yeah. huge pay cut. And well, they have, but if you talk to those people, their lifestyle has been massively enhanced. So it's not yeah. necessarily as simple as just sort of looking at the, let's just call them the election based headlines because we're about to see a whole lot more of this um, as, yeah. as both sides of politics try to pretend that they can somehow manipulate the numbers in a way that's going to make a difference. What really does matter, and I would just want to show you this graph here. So what this graph looks at for almost 20 year period from 2000 to 2019 is actually breaking that, that CPI, if you like, up into all the different types of goods and services. And you can see here from secondary, secondary education at the top has gone up 203% sort of over that sort of nearly 20 year period. Whereas um, if we look at audio, visual and computing equipment or technology based stuff, it's dropped 89%. Okay, and then you've got everything in between. So wages are up about 78% over that period of time, CPI up about 57%. So again, in the long term, wages, they have to uh, outstrip inflation. They, yep. Obviously, in the short term, that can vary, but it depends on how you measure it. But, but you can see there, you know, housing up 94%. You, 
gas and household fuels. That In the last couple of years, that's gone up even more. Electricity up nearly 200%. So what matters is, it's a bit like saying, well, the CPI has done X. So the, on average, that's what's happened. But that's like saying the average family is 2.1 people. You know, yeah. show, me, show me the 2.1 people walking around. So, so, so people who are at the bottom of this, people who are, you know, spending money on toys, games and hobbies, audio, visual and, and computer equipment and clothing, footwear and motor vehicles, they're having the time of their life. Nothing. Okay. So, oh, yeah, they're, they're saving money, yeah. Yeah, but people on medical and hospital services, electricity and gas, water and sewer, you know, so, so people at the, the back end of their lifetime. I heard a very interesting statistic um, uh, just the other day um, that, that we spend around 90% of the money we spend on healthcare, we spend in the last 10 years of our lives. So yeah. things like medical and hospital services and those sorts of things, the inflation effect of those for certain sectors, you know, for certain people are enormous. And so the yeah. fact that computers might be cheap is irrelevant to the, you know, 80 year old cancer patient, you know, or, or yeah. you know, those things. So th there's a lot more to the data that, 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 that needs to be sort of peeled apart if we're going to have a, you know, a proper conversation. Yeah, very good. So is rising, in uh, rising interest rates bad? Uh, again, are I'm going to go with depends. Bad, like, is it, everyone's worried about it and stock markets react when they say, oh, rates are going up 25%. You'll see Wall Street just drop straight away. Yep. Okay. So let's have a look at who it is bad for. That's probably the best thing. So yeah. it's bad for high yeah. value company, high valuation companies. Definitely bad for them. Yeah. Their valuations yeah. are going to get anything up to hemorrhaged. So very bad for them. It's very bad yeah. for uh, any industry or company that, that's very... Um, interest rate sensitive. So certain, you know, property sectors, infrastructure sectors can be, but they can also be winners yep. of those. So it again, depends on the detail. Um, it can be, it's expensive for cap, potentially for capital intensive business. Cost of capital will generally go up and therefore it's gonna yep. cost more to run those businesses. Um, it's also probably bad, as I was arguing before, it's probably bad for pensions in general. I think on the net, on, on the net pensioners are oh, worse yeah, off yeah. or those that are mathematically better off Aren't, aren't, aren't properly structured in the first place. So they're less worse off than they were before, but, they're, but that's because of yeah. how they were structured in the first place, I, I would argue. But it depends on why they go up. Keep in mind, the interest rates we're talking about here are coming from absolute record lows and, and yeah. from unsustainable. And again, keep in mind that the price of money is interest rates. So if the price of money is too cheap, right, then, then there's going to be too much of it. And too much of it makes it too hard. First of all, it blows up the prices of things so everyone who has things, their prices go up and everyone who doesn't have things. So it's a huge um, uh, driver of inequality, okay? Both in financial and lifestyle assets. You've got a house and you've got lots of super, you're living the dream. If you have neither of those things, not only do you not benefit from that rise, you, you're not getting the compensation because you're, everything is gonna be more expensive for you to get there, right? Yeah. So you're, you're losing out in sort of two ways. So it's very bad from, an, uh, from a financial equality perspective. Um, but if, it's, if the reason rates are going up is because we're trying to get back to some sort of more normalised level because the economy yeah. doesn't need all that priming because the economy is in pretty good shape and we are at record, pretty much near record un, uh, unemployment levels. We, we've got really strong economic growth when you consider the pandemic and all those other issues going on and the increasing yeah. prices. So, so interest rates going up to an okay level to reflect a reasonably healthy economy, that's a good thing. Right? It's yeah. the adjustment that matters. It's a bit like I was saying before. It's like, we know there's a storm coming. We don't know the nature of the storm or how bad it's going to be. So we just position ourselves to say, look, we'll get some roughness through this storm because that's what storms are like. But we're positioned in a way that coming out of it, we'll be ready to put the spinnakers up and, and we'll be smooth sailing. What you don't want to be is you don't want to be in a position where you're saying, we were trying to make hay in this you know, 30 year bull market and it's been going great right up to the point where it's all gonna come spectacularly undone and, and nothing's gone wrong yet. You know, these companies are still great companies. All we've got is yeah. a slight tick in valuation and suddenly 40% of my values disappeared permanently. It's not coming back, right? That, that, that is money lost yeah. because, and it's money lost simply because of the price that was paid for something, not because, not because you bought the wrong company. Oh, very good. So. Um... What can we do going forward? Like what, what should people look out for? What's, um, you know, investing? 
Yeah, so I think, you know, how you position is really, really important, making sure that you're not you're not over overly exposed to interest rate sensitive. That that's the critical thing, and that's yep. at that high valuation and some of those other sectors. Um, look, if if we're going to get a little bit sort of philosophical and 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 look at how do we undo this, this has been caused by too much money being printed. Let's be really clear yep. on that, right? So when too much money gets printed, that is inflation, and and yep. a lot of money was printed in the GFC, and there was probably some good reasons for most of that, but the money that was printed as a result of the, um, the coronavirus pandemic, makes the GFC look like a minor game of Monopoly. It, it is a, it's a huge increase in that amount. And the only way that that can be paid for, because we have to pay for this, right? There's no such thing as government yeah, money. Yeah. We have to pay for it. It's either our money today or our money tomorrow. And the only yeah. way we can pay for this is to devalue everything. It's too big, right? They're not paying it back. It, there's too much money for it to be paid back even if you could do it politically, which you can't. So we were, at, we were very much at the end of this debt cycle. The only way it can be paid back is to essentially devalue that money, okay? And the, the race is sort of on. We're seeing this all around the world. In fact, if the G7 get together and coordinate this now, where they devalue their currency sort of together. So in this environment, you don't want to hold a lot of currency, okay? You want to hold yeah. your own currency because that's where you live and spend. And we're lucky in Australia in some respects because we do print our own currency. And the demand for our currency internally is high because we've got to pay taxes in Aussie dollars and externally is reasonably high because we have this sort of economy that almost no matter what's going on in the world, people have to buy stuff from us. The world's going great, so they want to come and check out what we have, our education, our beaches, you know, our tourism, or the world's not going so great and they need to grow, so they've got to buy our iron ore and our energy and our agriculture, right? And our... Uh, that's something to hear about uh, the AAA ratings for the government and stuff like that. Like you said, that's because of the surety with our bonds. and Yeah, to a degree. But that's a relative measure too, right? So you can be a basket mm. case, but as long as you know we're not as bad as the other ones, then, mm. you know, then you can still have a good rating. So, so that, that, that's a relative thing. But even in Australia, I, I would say we're getting to the work, if we're not already, we're at the point where our debt levels are so high that I can't see them being politically, let alone actually, I can't see them politically being repaid. And, it, and there's no way that's happening in the US. It's, the US, it's a whole nother level and Europe as well, but, yeah. but the US in particular. So if, you're not, if you can't repay your debts, then you have to restructure them. And restructure them just simply means you have to, you have to give a permanent loss to your debt holders. Now keep in mind that if you hold currency, if you hold dollars, that is effectively a call on government money. That is, that is a debt, right? Yeah. And, and this is what Bernanke uses his excuse to do this in the GFC. He, he said a dollar note's just a zero coupon treasury bill, right? Which is why it well, allowed him to do it. So, so, so that has to happen. And, and so that's why we're going to see interest rates, you know, restructures, however we want to describe it, we're going to see the devaluation of debt. Now, not this month, not next month, maybe not even 2024, but that's definitely happening in the next, within the next decade. And so making sure that we're not overexposed to that money, that we continue to yeah. own assets that produce things that regardless of the denomination of the currency we use to trade it, whether it's, you know, dollars or, you know, Aussie dollars or, you know, whatever blockchain Bitcoin scenarios, make, whatever, whatever, It'll need to be official because you'll have to pay taxes in it. But whatever, whatever version of currency we maintain, US dollars, Australian dollars, whatever it is, the relative value of those is what we're talking about. And that relative value has already been inflated because of what's been printed. And that means all those prices will have to stay elevated. Right? And so making sure you're not somewhere where that real value has been destroyed, which is debt in particular. Uh, and by debt, I mean fixed interest investing. Um, then, you know, that, that there's, there's some of the key places to, to, to be. And it's not, again, as I was saying before, it, this is, it's beyond foreseeable now. This is, we're getting into the predictability yeah. range. We're nowhere near actionable. This is not something that you'll ever, I think, ever be able to trade in a way, you know, that isn't really high risk. So it's certainly not something we would ever do, but it's, that's part of that storm, you know, I was saying before in terms of making sure we're positioned for, that if it, if it really does unwind faster and, and, worse than people expect, which it tends to, that, that we're not overexposed to that. Oh, well, uh, so uh, anything else that you want to bring up about the interest rates at the moment or you... Um... 
No, it's, but, yeah, I look, the news isn't all bad. You know, it's, it's, it's a good thing. Rates going up a few percent is necessary for the economy in the long term. Yeah. Um, so we just have to wait and see, you know, how that plays out, I suppose. But, but we're pretty comfortable that we're as well positioned for this as we can be. And, and if anything, you know, we, we'd say it's overdue. If, I think the coronavirus, not only has it made it worse, but the coronavirus pandemic pushed this out a couple back. of years. So, yeah, yeah, so it's something we've been waiting for for, for, for quite some time. A very interesting space. It's something that um, you hear a lot about, but it's no detail behind it. You know, they just it's one of those rates of this, interest rates of that. So yeah, yeah, it's one of those areas where and the detail matters, right? It's 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 um yeah. you know as you know I, I like to bang on about that precision and clarity, right? So you need to be really really clear about it. and and we know this going into an election that 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 playbook will be well and truly out there, whereas people will you know they'll they'll say things that are true but contextually liberal, shall we say, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah. so that, that's something to be, to be mindful of, um, that you can use, yeah, yeah. As I said, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite quotes is if you torture a statistic long enough, you can get it to say anything. So I'm, I'm sure we'll see a lot more of that, but the general rule is, or the general position is, I think the next couple of years are predictable enough that we're, that we're not concerned. Yeah, so there's not going to, yeah. Or well, you can't say anything with absolute surety, but um, from your point of view, things no, no concern at this moment. Yeah, I, I think with, the, the bottom line is, you know, can you sleep at night knowing that, you know, that there's nothing that, that, nothing that can take you out? You know, there's nothing yeah. that's going to blow your capital or any portion of your capital up permanently or long term. You know, we, we, we always try and make sure that's our, that's our starting point in terms of positioning and that's, you know, I mean, zombie apocalypse aside, obviously, but but um, but in terms of you know unprecedented events, there's there's no black swans around the corner, you know that um, that 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 could reasonably put us in a position. And if anything, if you know, the cycle, you know, um, the end of the cycle does come and we move in the next one, if anything, we're we're well positioned for that. So we're we're quite comfortable where we are, and we're we're expecting yeah. a bit of a um, yeah, a bit of an interesting sort of six to twelve months for sure. No, very good. Well, that, that'd be about it for today, I think, Matt. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us again. And uh, we'll be back with you soon with our next episode of Money Matters. From Marcus, bye for now.